In this final section, I will discuss how permaculture is being applied in cities. I will also show some examples of natural buildings and how permaculture is being used to remediate land and to heal the planet. Since most people live in cities, urban permaculture is a big consideration. Urban gardening is growing in popularity. Patio gardens, rooftop gardens, and vertical gardens are being used in small spaces. People care about how their food is grown, the ethics involved in acquiring the food, the nutrition in it, and even the safety of it. There's also a realization that we are dependent upon specialized and delicate networks to bring food into cities. Fostering some self-reliance is smart in the event the system breaks down for any reason. This falls into the permaculture principle about planning for resiliency. Did you know about 50% of the food in Russia comes from the small country gardens, which total about 7% of their land? Community food forests are starting to pop up now. There's one in Seattle and one in Edmonton. Some people are addressing food deserts, which are areas where only fast food can be found in some poor inner cities. So, bus stop veggie stands are popping up, and mobile carts are bringing fresh produce in from neighboring farmers. Laws are being changed. In many urban locations, vegetable gardens were not allowed for many years. Neither were community gathering areas on public property. Natural and sustainable building design is considered in urban permaculture. Straw, bale, and cob buildings provide insulation values that are two to three times that of commercial fiberglass. If you want to learn more about ways permaculture can be applied to the city, I recommend Toby Hemingway's book, The Permaculture City. This is an Earthship home, which is an autonomous, off-grid, earthen home that utilizes solar and wind power. It also recycles gray water and even treats black water sewage to use in plantings. The founder of Earthship Homes is Michael Reynolds. This is the most basic Earthship design. It's called the Simple Survival. They sell designs and they teach courses and they also do a lot of work in impoverished areas, building schools and community buildings. All the Earthship houses have a greenhouse in the hottest portion, which buffers the house and allows food to be grown. Heat is stored in the thermal mass in the walls to be discharged at night. This is an interior of one of the Earthship homes. These are pictures of the Earthship headquarters in Taos, New Mexico, where they have a community of homes. They use recycled material, and in these images, they've used glass bottles in adobe walls quite beautifully. This is a photo of Corner Village in Portland. It was a project by City Repair, and the founder is Mark Lakeman. They painted the intersection, they built a free box library, and they put an information kiosk out. They also have a children's playhouse and a tea station. Permission to do it was denied, but a city politician gave them a permit for a weekend block party, and they ended up building this beautiful intersection. The mayor loved it. It slowed down traffic and really brought the community together. So this idea took off and can now be petitioned by your community if you're interested. This is the solar-powered tea station before it became legal. City Repair spends a lot of time teaching communities how to do this work, and Mark Lakeman says it's about building relationships, not about building stuff. This is the Cobb Angel Bench, which is beside the tea station at Corner Village. City Repair works to create gathering places in public spaces. This is a big change from streets being a thoroughfare designed to keep people and vehicles moving. The streets are now safer, more livable, and walkable. 
This is an image of Toby Hemingway in front of a shared Cobb sauna. They now have more shared gardens in the area, more shared childcare. People help each other paint houses. They have a stronger community. They even have a depaving campaign to green areas with unneeded pavement. Communitecture is the architecture firm involved with city repair. They do sustainable creative design and natural cob design and they create villages. In front of their office there are 100 edible plants and trees in a mini food forest. Mark Lakeman says there are more than 700 public space interventions now and no one knows the exact number. He's just happy it's getting out of control. Permaculture heals people. Natural gardening improves health and happiness. There's microbes in the soil that actually help you release serotonin. And the longest lived centenarians all do some form of natural gardening. These are the people that come from the blue zones. Gardening is among the best exercise you can get. You get fresh air, sunlight, you become in sync with nature's rhythms. You get to eat food with micro and phytonutrients that last only a short period of time. Plants respond to respectful care by growing better. You may have heard of the Cleve Baxter effect. He was a polygraph expert who showed that plants do indeed have sentience. When gardening, we communicate with our plants. We expose them to our voice. We might turn on genetic receptors through the DNA in our touch, sweat, and saliva. We might be encouraging them to grow for our individual health and benefit. Permaculture heals soil and makes food nutritious again. Dr. August Dunning conducted studies on mineral loss in food. The decline started with mechanized farming in the 1950s. It sharply declined again with pesticide, herbicide, and fungicide use, and then again with recent GMO and glyphosate use. Mineral loss is correlated with much higher disease, and today it takes 36 apples to get the same amount of iron you used to get from one apple in 1950. Permaculture brings minerals and nutrients back again into the living soil. Permaculture is organic, it utilizes polycultures, and typically doesn't till the soil, so it brings minerals and returns nutrients back again. Food becomes more nutritious and abundant as the permaculture garden matures. It also results in perpetual, beautiful, satisfying landscapes that nourish our minds, bodies, and souls. Mycelium is being used to clean waterways and contaminated soil. This is called mycoremediation. Oyster mushroom mycelium reduces E. coli and breaks down hydrocarbons. Garden giants remove mercury and heavy metals from soil and water. The lignin found in dense trees is of a similar structure to the toxins, so mushrooms are well adapted to clean the environment. Mycelium is like an underground neural network that connects plants and trees through their roots. It feeds them water and nutrients, like phosphorus. It helps them build immunity to bugs, and it allows them to communicate chemically through the network. They can warn each other when pests attack. It allows trees to support other trees in need and teach seedlings how to thrive. They can send carbon, water, and resources through this network. Mycelium even stops feeding pioneer plants when their time has come. In return for all this work, they get sugars from plants. Mycelium is invaluable to soil health, and tilling damages it, and fertilizers do damage too. Some scientists are calling this the wood wide web, and the underground fungal internet can be very large. In fact, the largest living species on the planet is a honey fungus in Oregon, which is 2.4 miles across. Paul Stamitz wrote a very interesting book called Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Save the World. Plants can also be used to clean the environment, and this is called phytoremediation. 
Microbial remediation is when bacteria are used to assist in breaking down toxins. This project, Healing the Cut, Bridging the Gap, was a project by Oliver Kellhammer, who is a knowledgeable permaculture instructor who also teaches at Parsons School of Design. In Vancouver, the Grandview Railway cut through a very lush wildlife area. So Vancouver held a competition for artists to forward ideas for decorating the new bridge in 1993. Oliver and Janice Bowley made a proposal to reforest the area and create a viewing platform for ecological restoration to be viewed from the bridge. They won the competition but couldn't start for several years. There were legal issues to iron out as it was an artistic and therefore copyrightable project. They wanted to pursue the intellectual property status so the forest would be protected as art. The image on the right shows what the forest looked like after it started to grow in. On the top left is an image of Oliver using willow and cottonwood cuttings, and they were just laid onto the soil and allowed to reroot. They also used bioengineering dam structures shown in the bottom left, where cuttings were staked in areas where water flowed and it dammed and slowed the erosion and built the soil into plant forms. The bottom right shows the willow three months after planting, and the upper right shows nest boxes that were built for chickadees and swallows. They fertilized the area and brought in seeds that sprouted native plants. Reversing desertification is another area where permaculture is being applied such as this Greening the Desert project by Jeff Lawton. This is in Jaffa in the Dead Sea Valley of Jordan. It's a one-acre plot where Jeff and a crew of interns created a food forest, education center, and experimental permaculture plot. They built walls to collect silt during floods, they built swales, and they recycle gray water. They conserve the scarce water and nutrients in the built-up fertile soil. They created cooling microclimates to protect tender crops from the desert heat. They used composting toilets, chicken tractors, worm composting, and foraging ducks. There's a lot of success in the area, and the compost worms are being shared. Here's a picture of the chickens enjoying the shaded area under the canopy. Permaculture often integrates domestic animals. It places them on the land, as nature intended. Unlike in modern factory farms, the animals remain healthy and the land becomes enriched by their presence. They can carry out their health-giving, symbiotic relationship. Wild animals are not excluded. There is always an area left in the natural state in a permaculture plot. Many people plant extra food for the wild animals, and they in return enrich the land. Without birds and beneficial insects, the ecosystem would quickly get out of balance. Animal droppings add to the nutrients in the soil, and their gentle scratching is the best kind of tilling. Some gardeners will plant perimeter fruiting hedges and trees that may not be very palatable to people, but are appreciated by less discerning wildlife. The planet is giving us feedback now that we need to address. The land, air, water, and creatures are clearly suffering from our untenable methods of interacting with the earth. Monocrop production and the use of poisons, plowing, and salting with fertilizers is breaking natural laws. The underlying ideologies that have for too long promoted human dominance, conquest, the use of technology unquestioningly, and the hoarding of natural resources are unreasonable, juvenile, and ultimately self-destructive. Industrial agriculture mines the soil for nutrients without efforts to heal and replenish it. It requires the use of pesticides, herbicides, and fungicides. These pollute and kill the smallest life forms, and the entire ecosystem is now suffering the consequences. When an insect attempts to devour a monocrop, they are not the enemy. 
they are actually assisting nature by removing the unnatural and unhealthy condition and encouraging diversity to return. Natural and permaculture landscapes can't be decimated by insects or animals because they encompass varied, healthy, and balanced ecosystems. They remediate previous soil damage, remove toxins from the environment, and bring life back into balance. I feel we have an obligation to address the global destruction and pain and to improve the lives of others, animals, and the entire planet. When we become conscious of a problem and aware of the solution, I feel we have a duty to act. Permaculture gives us a set of principles to help return our world to a respectful, cooperative paradise. We can become stewards that help create the unity and coherence that all life seeks. Permaculture reveals that the more we consider others and the earth, and the more we share, the more there is for us and for every inhabitant of the planet. To me, it's about recognizing our interconnectedness and oneness. When we embrace the relationship between each and all, life reflects that unison back to us, and we experience resonance and harmony. When we all comprehend our connection, the earth will become a loving paradise. Many permaculture specialists allowed me to use their photos and talk about their work. My gratitude goes out to them and to all of you who are busy making the world a better place.